Good afternoon, everyone out there. Uh, sorry, a little bit of te technical difficulty, so we're starting a little late today. But thanks so much for joining us here at the National Museum of Industrial History's Virtual Museum. This is, I think, the 16th or 17th program we've been running, so we're, we're happy this is a continuing series. And for all you out there who are joining in who haven't seen any of the rest of our series, we're running all kinds of things for the museum. Uh, coming next week, uh, talking about their great incubation space where they take companies and expand them and talking about how they do that and the, the industrial aspects behind that. That'll be next week, as well as National Museum of Industrial History's historian Mike Pierce is joining us again to talk about um, some pumping machinery. So if you're interested in, in steam, pumps, uh, things of that nature, uh, please join us for that. And for all of you that are out there that have kids or have grandkids, we're also doing a couple of different youth programs that we've launched. We have three different ones. One is virtual story time, which we take industrial kids books and present them. That goes on Saturdays and Sundays at 10 a.m. So please join us tomorrow morning. And we also have virtual tinker time and quotes and quests, two programs that we're partnering with our local PBS station and Bethlehem Area Public Library to present to you. You can find all those programs and more either here if you're watching on Facebook um, stay tuned to our Facebook page, or you can go to our website at noih.org and find all of our virtual programming. And also, if you're tuning in live or watching us afterwards, again, thanks for joining us. Uh, throughout the museum's closure, we've been trying to present all of these great programs. We've been able to have people from across the world join us, uh, either watching or as guests. And we're up to something like 18 or 19 hours of original content right now that have been viewed uh, tens of thousands of times. So we're very happy that we've been able to do that. And we ask you if you're able to do so to please support the museum right now. There's a couple easy ways that you can do so. Uh, one is just making a general donation to the museum, or you can purchase a museum membership, um, or use Amazon Smile if you're shopping at home. Those are just a couple of the ways that you can help us out right now. And again, you can find information on that at noah.org, or we're gonna be posting a link down in the comments shortly. Um, but without further ado, I'd like to introduce our guest today, uh, Richard Hall. He's talking about John Roebling, who was one of the 19th century's most brilliant engineers, ingenious inventors, and successful manufacturers. Uh, we're so happy to have him. If you caught our talk about Washington Roebling uh, by Erica Wagner, uh, I think it was last week or so, she put us in touch with Richard, who just came out with a, I think it was the first biography in 75 years, he had said, um, about John Roebling. So we're very happy to have him and have this kind of continuation uh, of Erica's great talk. Um, Richard is the as Associate Professor of Interdisciplinary Studies at John Jay College of Criminal Justice, CUNY, and he's the author of two books, uh, The Brooklyn Bridge of Cultural History and Are the Brooklyn Bridge a Visual History, as well as his new one. He's a native of Leeds in the UK, uh, but he's now living in uh, Brooklyn with his daughter, where he's calling in from. Thank you, Richard, so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, thank okay. you. Sorry. No problem. I'm going to pass it off to you. And uh, if anybody out there has questions, please leave them in the comments as we're going along, and we'll try to answer them at the end of the talk. Thank you. Thank Go you, Glenn. Ahead. Thank you. I uh, just want to start by thanking Glenn and the museum for inviting me to this, do this talk. Uh, I'm sorry I can't give the, the, the talk at the museum, which I know is a marvelous place, and one that will always remind me of my uh, late friend Don Sayenga, who showed me around a few years ago. Don was a friend and an inspiration. He probably knew more about the Roeblings than anyone else and I'd like to dedicate this talk to him. Uh, this is also my first Zoom talk, uh, and so it's very strange to be sat down uh, and to not have an audience. Um, and I think I've always had a bit of a horror of ending up being one of those people that sort of sits, ends up sitting in front of a computer screen talking very loudly, uh, surrounded by nobody, but here I am. So uh, pandemic culture, I suppose. Uh, I'm just gonna share my screen and um, put up my, uh, PowerPoint, there we go. And there we go, slideshow from the beginning. So uh, I'm here because as Glenn said, uh, I just published a biography of John Roebling. Uh, believe it or not, as Glenn said, it's the first biography of Roebling in 75 years. In fact, 48 years ago in the Great Bridge, David McCullough noted that there was quote, no first rate biography of any of the Roeblings. And no one has really tried to answer that call until recently. My good friend Erica Wagner took care of the Washington part a couple of years ago with their excellent chief engineer, Washington Roebling, the man who built the Brooklyn Bridge. So hopefully with Engineering America, I'm taking care of John. So the question uh, I get most about uh, this book is how long have you been working on it? Which always makes me wince a little bit 
thinking the book must seem very imposing and big. Um, well, I started thinking about the book all the way back in 2004 after finishing my first book on the Brooklyn Bridge. Which, uh, and I thought I knew John and I thought I could bang out a biography in, in a couple of years. But banging out a biography is a really hard thing to do, not least because of all the preconceived ideas you bring to it. History has thus far given us a very two-dimensional John Roebling. It has praised him as an engineer and tended to disparage him as a human being. In other words, you definitely want him to build you a house, but you might not want to invite him around for dinner afterwards. We tend to think of John as a genius, but also as steely and aloof, also intractable, demanding, impatient, judgmental, humorous, and volatile. Not, I imagine, helped out by such images as this. Um, we also tend to think of John as a bit of a fool, the guy who contracted tetanus and treated it with the water cure until he died. Also as a bit of a weirdo, a man who attended seances and read and believed all sorts of spiritual mystics. This was the John Robing I thought I knew because I'd read the only available biographies by Hamilton Schuyler and David Steinman, both many decades old even at that point. And because I had read Washington Robings as, the, as, yet, as then, unpublished memoir of his father, a complicated account written late in life that may say as much about Washington as about his father, as in fact most memoirs do, I suspect. I thought John was a flawless engineer and a flawed human being, but then I started. It's a humbling process holding someone's reputation in your hands. You learn to criticize less and to think more, to remember your own stumbles and hope they meet with more patience and understanding than judgment. One might also hope that we are understood through the totality of our life, not by a handful of incidents and decisions, or just as importantly, on the word of one or two other people, some of whom may actually be our children. The problem of biography is the problem of how to think about other people, about people who often live in very different times than us and in vastly different circumstances. A friend of mine, a well-known biographer, told me a couple of years into the project that I needed an elevator speech. I need to be able to boil John down to a phrase or two. This book is about da-da, or the secret to John was this. Um, and I tried, but the more I tried, the less I seemed to understand. The John Roebling I thought I knew began to fade the more research I did and to grow more complex. But what did come into view was the rather obvious and simple truth that it's hard to make sense of a person's life. Often the telling details are hidden away from plain sight. Likewise, a life takes a long time to live, and we are very different people at different points and in different circumstances and in front of different people. If I wanted to get a sense of who John was, I had to live his life with him, gather as much information as I could, and live the accumulated fortunes of his life alongside him. Only then might I begin to form any useful ideas about him. So what did I find? Who was John Roebling? This is uh, a slightly softer image of John, um, and it's really the only painting we have of John. It's the only painting that was done of John. Um, the first thing I want to say is that I lived with John for much longer than they ever expected, and I never grew bored of him or his company, and I even grew quite fond of him, which may tell you something about me and about him or about the relationship with, between biographers and Stockholm Syndrome. The second is that many of the things we think we know about John Roebling are wrong, even the good stuff. He was certainly a great engineer, but not without his blind spots. And the things he's most famous for, the way I wrote business and the Brooklyn Bridge, were raised to their final dizzying heights by his sons, not by him. The bad stuff is also a little too simplistic. It often fails to account for the context of the times John lived in. It also relies too heavily on one or two sources of sometimes unreliable information. In what follows, I'll try and give you a set, an overview of John's life and a few observations about him as both an engineer and as a human being. The broad outlines of John's life can be traced quite quickly. He was born and raised in, in the German town of Mulhausen during the Napoleonic Wars. This is a, a, a drawing, uh, an, actually a lithograph of Mulhausen done by John himself. He uh, drew this uh, when he was 19 years old in 1825. Um, John had a cousin who was also a printer. So this image was printed into lithographs and sold locally. Uh, when he was 18, John left Mulhausen to attend the Prussian Building Academy in Berlin, where he heard Hegel lecture and became interested in suspension bridges. Uh, this is an image from one of John's uh, student notebooks, uh, a, a, a 
a drawing of the Hammersmith Bridge in London. Uh, a year after college, he headed off to Arnsberg in Westphalia to work as a civil engineer building roads. For reasons that are hard to fathom, he stayed for over three years, but he made use of his time, getting an excellent education in all aspects of practical engineering. He even designed two different suspension bridges while he was out in Westphalia, although neither of them were commissioned. And it's worth mentioning that John designed two suspension bridges before he'd even seen one in the flesh. John never returned to Berlin and never finished his engineering degree. He returned to Mulhausen in 1825, 28, and soon met John Etzler, with whom Roebling took English lessons and discussed emigration. Etzler himself later gained some lasting fame with his book, The Paradise Within the Reach of All Men, which was reviewed by Henry David Thoreau. The book is perhaps the first to advocate also for solar, wind and, uh, solar, wind and tide power. Um, it has gained Etzler recently the, the moniker of the first great green technologist. Um, Together, the two Johns founded the Mulhausen Emigration Society in 1830 and set off for the US in 1831 in hopes of establishing communal farming settlement. But the two fell out, and actually everyone on board fell out en route, and they all went their separate ways upon arriving in the US. John made his way out to Western Pennsylvania with his brother Carl, bought 1,600 acres of land in Butler County, where he founded the village of Saxonburg. This is really the, first, the only image we have of the uh, er, Saxonburg in its early years. Um, notice it's again printed by uh, Roebling's cousin, I think it's Ernst Roebling in Mulhausen. Um, clearly um, this image uh, by T. Goswitch uh, was drawn in uh, Saxonburg and sent out to Mulhausen where it's printed up probably as a promotional tool designed to lure settlers to Western Pennsylvania. Uh, John adapted to his new country well. He already had the rudiments of the language when he arrived, and he also spoke excellent French. And he settled in an area with plenty of Germans, and with plenty more to come. Uh, 1831 was really the great, one of the great turning points in German emigration to the US. Uh, Germans trickled into the US before. They'd been there for, since the beginning of colonization, really. But it's more accurate to describe the fact that they sort of trickled into the US. But after 1830, 1831, it became a real flood. Um, I think 10, at least 10 times as many Germans emigrated uh, to the US in the 1830s as in the 1820s. Um, even though he adapted very well to his new country, he did not adapt very well to his new life. He tried farming, but he was terrible at it. And slowly he returned to engineering, working on the Pennsylvania Mainline Canal and conducting railroad surveys for his state. In 1841, he hit on the idea of making rope out of spiraled wire, a notion that made his fortune and helped change the landscape of, the, of his adopted country. He got the idea traveling on the Allegheny Portage Railroad and reading the yearly reports about its operating budget. Inclined planes, as seen here, were just taking off in the US and were used to drag people and raw materials, mainly coal, up and down mountains. They used traditional hemp ropes, which were costly and inefficient. They rarely lasted much more than a single season. Rope made from spiraled wire lasted much longer and was adaptable to many different uses rigging, cranes, derricks, you name it. The inclined planes themselves were the forerunners to funiculars, cable car systems, and eventually elevators. Um, I think you can sort of detect the beginnings of all three in this image um, of the inclined pain, plane at Mount uh, Pisgah. Um, all of which, all of which, all of these inventions, cable cars, funiculars, elevators, exploded into the American landscape into the mid, mid to late 19th century. And all of these were supplied by John A. Roebling's son's company, who were the largest single manufacturer of wire rope in the US until well into the 20th century. Roebling wires pulled elevators up and down new tall buildings, making possible thousand foot skyscrapers in New York and Chicago, held up suspension bridges of prodigious length from the Hudson River to the Golden Gate, drove mass transit cable car systems in thousands of towns and cities all over the US. All of this and more flowed from the industry John set up in his backyard in the 1840s. John's wire rope business liberated him to become something more than just a working engineer, something more like a gentleman engineer. Engineering wasn't what put food on the Roebling table, thankfully. If it had have been, John's career would have looked much different. His manufacturing interests allowed him to pick and choose what projects he undertook. And with an income secured, John devoted much of the rest of his professional life to building suspension bridges. In nearby Pittsburgh, he built the Allegheny Aqueduct in 1844, and the Monongahala Suspension Bridge a year later in 1845. This is the Monongahala Suspension Bridge. 
Between 1848 and 1852, he built four suspension aqueducts in upstate New York for the Delaware and Hudson Canal Company, the largest of which still exists, the oldest suspension bridge in the United States. And this is the, uh, uh, the largest of those bridges. This is it being used as a canal aqueduct, um, but it's since been retrofitted for uh, automobile use. So much of the, the wood, uh, wooden structure has been replaced, but the cables are still the same. Uh, and I say it ranks as the oldest um, continually operating suspension bridge in the US. Um, John's great triumphs were the Niagara Falls International Suspension Bridge, um, which was the first fully functional railroad suspension bridge in the world, and the Covington and Cincinnati Suspension Bridge, the longest suspension bridge at the time it was opened in 1867. In between, he built the St. Clair Street Bridge in Pittsburgh. He was at work on what, have, what would have been his masterpiece, the Brooklyn Bridge, when he was felled by a tragic accident. This image here, which is also behind me and on the cover of my book, um, is the official uh, drawing that uh, accompanied uh, John's uh, first plans for the Brooklyn Bridge that he submitted to a, uh, in 1867. So this is really the first image of a sort of, of John's vision of the Brooklyn Bridge, or the first image uh, of the bridge uh, presented to the public. Um, John, of course, is best uh, known as a suspension bridge engineer. It's his bridges that have made him famous, and rightly so. I'm going to talk now a little bit about his reputation as a flawless engineer, or about what he got right and what he got wrong. Suspension bridges are a balancing act. Oops, there we go. Um, this is an image of, uh, from James Finley. Um, uh, James Finley was, uh, built the first modern suspension bridge uh, in 1801 in, Western, in Fayette County, I think, in Western Pennsylvania. Um, and as you can see from this wonderfully simple design, uh, suspension bridges, as they are a balancing act. The towers have to support the cables. The cables have to support the roadway via the hangers. The roadway needs to be flexible enough to account for movement, but rigid and heavy enough to resist vibration and wind. When the countervailing forces don't countervail, you have a problem. And it took much of the 19th century to really work out how exactly those forces balance. At the beginning of the century, most of them fall down, or at least suffer frequent significant damage. At the end, most of them don't. And John is really the key figure in this, although as I said earlier, he was by no means infallible. The main enemies of suspension bridges are high winds and rust. Think about a rope bridge in a gale, about how it moves. The established way of thinking about that for much of the early part of the 19th century was just to make the floor as heavy as possible to account for this. Or if the bridge moves around in the wind, then make them, if your bridge moves around the wind, make it heavy enough that it doesn't. But often that just created a heavier weight being forced around by the wind. Think of a plastic bag with some groceries in it, yank it up and it falls and stays intact. But now put a really heavy weight in it and do the same. The bag snaps, which is what happened to many, spri many bridges. Heavy roadways lurching up and down and pulling on the hangers and from there to the suspension cables. Countless suspension bridges suffered significant damage or destruction in high winds in the early 19th century. Uh, this is an image of the Brighton Chain Bridge, uh, which actually became quite famous. It was painted by Turner and Constable. Um, its cables and flooring, though, were swept away in high winds multiple times in the early 19th century. Um, it was designed by Samuel Brown, who has also designed the Union Bridge over the Tweed River in the UK. It's actually between England and Scotland, um, which is currently the oldest modern suspension bridge still standing. Uh, gales acting on a too flexible floor also create torsion or twisting, which, like resonance created by marching armies, tends to amplify itself and taunt it becomes dangerous. Unless you try to mitigate it, in this case creating a rigid roadway by means of some type of stiffening truss running the entire length of the bridge laterally, uh, which is a problem John obsessed over and worked on for years. The best example of this is actually in the 20th century with the famous Tacoma Narrows Bridge, uh, which um, began to twist and move uh, in the 1840s and the in 1940s. As you can see, this is no, no attempt to stiffen the roadway and the bridge starts to move like this. It's another image of the bridge sort of breaking apart. Uh, anyone who's interested in this, there was this video footage of it and go onto YouTube and just put Tacoma Narrows Bridge Disaster or Tacoma Narrows Bridge in it. And you'll see images of the, the, the torsion or the twisting getting worse and worse and worse as the wind whips it about. Um, what happened to the Tacoma Narrows Bridge in 1940 also 
happened at the Wheeling Bridge um, almost a century earlier in 1854, only a few years after it was opened. The momentum created by its own dead weight when forced into motion by heavy winds worked its own destruction. The Wheeling Bridge was designed by Charles Ellett, and here's an image of Charles Ellett. Um, it was opened in 1849, and we tend to think of the development of the suspension bridge in the middle of the 19th century as a competition between Roebling and Ellett. Ellett built the first long set band suspension bridge in the US, the Fairmount Bridge uh, in 1850, 1842 uh, in Philadelphia, and followed it up by building the Wheeling Bridge uh, seven years later, at the time, the longest suspension bridge in the world. And I just want to point out here, uh, these are, these are the Ellett's two famous bridges, and, and, and point out the, what we call the garland system of suspension cables uh, on both bridges, which is a practice favored by French engineers and by Ellett. Um, and here again, the garland system at the side. John preferred to bind the cables together and wrap them, a practice he pioneered and believed protected them but also help provide, help provide a stiffer and more rigid bridge. Uh, wrapped and bound cables are now standard, of course, a thing that uh, John uh, pioneered. Um, at the time of the opening of the Wheeling Bridge, Ellett's reputation was much greater than John's until 1845, uh, 1854, when a massive gale swept through the Ohio Valley and arrived in Wheeling. The whole of Br Ellett's bridge began, quote, heaving and dashing with tremendous force. Reported the, reported the local newspaper, the Wheeling Intelligencer. For a few moments, we watched it with breathless anxiety, lounging like a ship in a storm. At one time, it, the bridge's floor, rose to nearly the height of the tower and then fell and twisted and writhed and was dashed almost bottom upward. At last, there seemed to be a determined twist along the entire span, about one half of the flooring being nearly reversed and went down the immense structure from its dizzying height to the stream below with an appalling crash and roar. Nearly the entire structure struck the water at the same instant, dashing up an unbroken column of foam across the river to the height of at least 40 feet. The destruction of Alex Bridge was more or less total. All the cables on the north side except two were ripped from the towers. All the cables on the south side were torn from their anchorage. While the entire woodwork was, quote, shivered to atoms, which is also a phrase which perfectly describes what also happened to Alex's reputation as a result, by contrast, John opened his Niagara Falls suspension bridge the following year, which not only resisted the frequent gales that plagued the Niagara Peninsula, but also carried fully loaded trains across it. Here we see an image of John's Niagara Bridge. A few examples better illustrate the fate of the two engineers. Allett never built another bridge, although he did repair the Wheeling Bridge. While John went on to build the Covington and Cincinnati Bridge, the longest in the world, and get the contract for the Brooklyn Bridge. It was John who pioneered the use of inclined stays, both above and below the bridge, which you can see here, um, and tried to incorporate elements of a stiffening truss into the roadway. Uh, the roadway on John's Niagara suspension bridge was stiffened by a wooden truss and metal cross braces. You see here uh, the, the, the massive effort to make sure that there was a rigid structure at the heart of the roadway. Uh, it was Roebling who obsessed so much over rigidity and stiffness and built them into as many elements of his bridge as he possibly could. Uh, this is uh, some of his original plans for the Nongahala Bridge uh, in 1845. Again, this is the first bridge that uses inclined stays. There are also braces underneath the roadway, and you can see the roadway itself. There are these cross braces running along the side. Even from the very beginning, John was obsessed by creating a rigid, stiff roadway that would resist wind force or aerodynamic force. Um, Thankfully, no one died during the Wheeling Bridge disaster, but plenty did in the 19th century. The deadliest suspension bridge disaster in history took place in Angers, France in 1850. This is the Angers Suspension Bridge. Um, and the whole event was almost scripted to illustrate both all the things that could possibly go wrong with suspension bridges, but also nicely summarize the things John got right and the things he got wrong about suspension bridges. On April the 16th, 1850, several hundred soldiers were marching over the bridge in high winds. The soldiers were under strict instructions to break step, but the gale was strong and the bridge began to sway and move and then bang. One of the main suspension cables came loose and the whole thing, bridge and soldiers and all, were pitched into the river below. And to make matters worse, the soldiers had been ordered to march with bayonets fixed, meaning those who survived the fall had to then somehow dodge a bunch of falling knives. 223 people died. 
And this is the, uh, the Angus Bridge afterwards. The problem wasn't just the gale, but that other enemy of suspension bridges, rust. The heart of a suspension bridge is its suspension cables, which need to be firmly anchored to either shore. But if water and air can get into the anchorages and nobody notices, rust forms, compromising the strength of the cables, which is what happened at Angus. The cables and the soldiers, sorry, the gales and the soldiers didn't bring down the roadway, but it did put extra pressure on the anchors, which had significant rust damage and just gave way. John's first encounter with a suspension bridge in the flesh uh, was 20 years earlier, before, 20 years before the Angers Bridge disaster, and it was in Bamberg, Germany in 1830. This is the bridge he saw. He learned many things from the encounter, most of, foremost of which was how to think about suspension cables. Most bridge engineers at the time clamped their suspension cables to the towers, as you can see here, but John understood that suspension cables are elastic. They move. They expand and contract thanks to changes in the temperature, and they need time to find the equilibrium that comes with supporting so much weight. Bridge cables also need to move to account for the traffic that travels along from one end of the span to the other. If the cables are fixed to the bridge, that movement is curtailed, and the cables pull on the towers, creating stress fractures in both. John thought a more sensible solution lay in placing a, a saddle or roller bearings on the top of the towers. And this is an image from uh, the Brooklyn Bridge, which perfectly illustrates the system that he set up for this. Um, this would allow for the cables to move back and forth, thus preventing excessive strain on the towers and the cables. And he was right. Saddles became a standard feature on suspension bridges. But it was also short-sighted, leading to one of the most important things John got wrong about suspension bridges. If cables move along the whole length of a bridge, then that process starts at the very ends. Cables are typically attached at either end of a suspension bridge to a large metal anchor plate, which is held in place by great masses of stone and cement. This is an image of the anchor plate, again, in the Brooklyn Bridge. Brooklyn Bridge has just so much more images uh, that you can use to illustrate uh, engineering uh, issues. Uh, so I, I tend to use them, even though John was dead by this point. Uh, here you see that the, what they call the, the spider um, structure here, and these little openings here, which anchor chains would be. Uh, attached in there and from the anchor chains to the suspension cables. Nowadays, anchorages um, are, kept, uh, are kept open so the wires and anchor chains can be inspected. As mentioned, rust is one of the great enemies of suspension bridges, and the one place you don't want rust is in the anchorage, where the cables are held in place. But John didn't grasp this. He sealed up his anchorages with stone and cement, creating what he called, quote, a solid envelope, excluding air and moisture. Such a process was intended to anchor his cables and also to prevent air and water penetrating down to the place where the cables meet the anchor plate. But if cables can pull on a stone tower and create fissures over time, then they can do the same to a sealed anchorage. Sooner or later, the same vibratory and thermal force acting on the cables above ground would play out in the anchorages, tugging on John's solid envelope, slowly loosening the cables from their cement casing. Once those tiny cracks are formed, gravity would do the rest, allowing moisture to trickle down to the anchorages and collect near the cable ends. This was potentially disastrous when coupled with the overall scheme. In an open anchorage, the cables can be inspected and repainted and repaired. In a closed anchorage, there was no way to tell what was happening to the anchors, the very, thing that were holding the whole, the very things that were holding the whole bridge up. And this is exactly what happened in most of John's bridges. It was a serious flaw, quietly unearthed in the case of John's Niagara Bridge by a team of engineers in 1877. Uh, this is the uh, excavating the anchorages on that bridge. Over the course of 20 years, deflection on the bridge had slowly increased, and the Great Western Railway Road, which ran about 30 to 40 trains a day over the span, asked the bridge company to conduct a thorough examination of it. They found that all was well up by the surface, but the corrosion was widespread down by the anchorage. And so at this point, worth reminding everybody where exactly the Niagara Bridge uh, was situated. Uh, no one would want one of those suspension cables to become unmoored. Um, subsequently, the anchorages in John's Niagara Bridge were almost entirely rebuilt, as they were subsequently for his St. Clair Street Bridge in Pittsburgh, where the same problem was discovered in 1883, and John's Covington and Cincinnati Bridge were in it during an extensive renovation of the span in the 1890s. The same problem 
It hasn't plagued the Brooklyn Bridge for the simple reason that John didn't build it. His son Washington did. And he understood the need to create open anchorages. Nowadays, in our time of, of extreme specialization, we tend to think about civil engineers as closed off from broader social questions, selling their skills in metallurgy and mechanics to whoever has the requisite financing. Many might look, look to make their mark on the world, but their mark is often determined by aesthetics, size, or pure problem solving. Uh, this is an image, by the way, of just John with a bunch of other engineers uh, on the upper or Clifton suspension bridge at Niagara. Uh, this is actually the only photograph we have of uh, John outside of a photogra photographic studio. He is, the, uh, he is the man in the tan coat down here, always unique, always one to stand out. Um, but this wasn't always the case. 19th century engineers often saw themselves as addressing what we might call the problems of civilization, rather than simply the problems of physics. And they wrote not just about specific problems they faced in their work, but about the impact they hoped it would have on the world. They had vigorous debates about education, about municipal politics, urban problems, and other issues. We are quite used to thinking of artists, writers, politicians, etc., as intellectuals, but not so with engineers. The very people who planned and created the built environment are in which all this thinking got done and about which much of that thinking revolved. Such a man was John Rowling. John wasn't just an engineer. He thought about how engineering might affect the world. He was a deep reader of philosophy, and an engaged social critic, reeling against slavery as early as 1831 and in favor of distributive justice during the Civil War. He was a man who saw connections between things, between technology and society, between building things and building a better world. He believed that the endlessly repeatable forms of modern technology could bring about a more perfect union. And I'll just summarize too quickly two examples I use in my book. Um, and I also want to just say at this point that John wrote all the time and throughout his life. His private papers are huge, copious, uh, and encompass not just technical works and notebooks and the like, but literally thousands and thousands of pages of thoughts and ideas about society, about the state of the world, about philosophy and philosophers, you name it. And it's hard to underestimate both the size and the importance of this material. Uh, most of these writings are mainly private, uh, but they are the key to understanding John and I think I'm really the first person to read them all. Uh, this is the first page, for example, of uh, John's The Truth of Nature, uh, for example, which is merely one of dozens and dozens of pieces he wrote in his life, but it's also 1,502 pages long. Um, and the handwriting is actually a lot more legible here than in most of the things he wrote. The point is that there was a real important private John who wrote and wrote and wrote, who had lots of ideas about the world. Um, and this is the, the, this is the John I've tried really hard to get to know in my book. Um, and it's sort of the John that's been missing from our narrative about him. Uh, John believed that engineers could harness the resources of the natural world to create a more equal society. As he wrote in 1862 during the Civil War, and I'll just say that um, John wrote do dozens of pieces during the Civil War, often about the state of US society. Uh, again, it's, very, it's real key to thinking about John as a person. Uh, and it's a really interesting period of the Civil War for John because he's sort of inactive. And so he has lots of time to sit and write and think um, and express his ideas about the, about the world and about, about US society and along with its criticisms and his hopes for US society and along with its criticisms. As comforts increase and become more plentiful, more within the reach of every human being, in the same ratio, social distinctions will be leveled down and common fellow feeling will be cultivated. It is the great mission of science to abolish slavery and to establish perfect freedom in its stead, which consists of perfect emancipation from natural as well as spiritual bonds. The church refuses to assist, therefore science is left alone. Uh, and later in the same essay, with the vast power of physical nature under our control, the day will come when in consequence of the general diffusion of all essential comforts and even luxuries, the now almighty dollar will have lost its charm and will have lost its controlling power. Then and not until then will man be prepared to inaugurate another era in the history of his race. John styled this the era of redemption in which technology would lead to a profound moral adjustment. Human selfishness and exclusiveness will abate and the true freedom of the mind shall be achieved. Man's sympathies will be enlarged. The human family will become one fast brotherhood 
and the weak as well as the strong will be embraced. To use a more specific example, John was a vocal proponent of both the Transcontinental Railroad and the Atlantic Cable as works of profound social connection and unity. Uh, and this is the, what I'm going to talk about now is from an essay called The Great Central Railroad. Um, John both wrote copiously privately, but was occasionally a sort of public intellectual, we'd call a public intellectual, giving talks here before the Pittsburgh Board of Trade, or, or writing articles for newspapers about all sorts of things. He was very interested in technical education, and he thought there should be a national university uh, devote, devoted to engineering, for example. Um, and in this, in this piece, he talks about railroads and telegraphs may be hailed as the latest offspring of the spirit of the present age. They have imparted a new and most powerful impulse to the social movement, from which will yet flow a vast train of beneficial results. And if anyone was wondering how this exactly would happen, John was happy to clarify. One of the best proofs of the advancement of mankind in true civilization is that the industrial efforts of nations are no longer squandered upon the creation of vast amounts of pride and of war. Like a magic wand, they instead open the slumbering resources and long hidden treasures of the earth, drawing to bonds of union and amity isolated into individuals, as well as communities and nations, unchain, lo unchain long cherished prejudices and selfishness and cause to be made more simultaneous exertions in all that is useful and good. Railroads and telegraphs were the nurse of modern civilization. They would band people together, heal divisions, and make neighbors out of rivals and free people out of the enslaved. Engineers saw railroads and telegraphs along with suspension bridges and other great works of connection as great works of technology and of moral advance, as physical things embodying functional design and philosophical principles. John and others of his ilk were engineers through and through, but we might also describe them as practical philosophers or functional intellectuals. They saw a future made of iron and steel molded by engineers into a world of unity and equality. This, as much as anything else, is one of the reasons I call my book Engineering America. Uh, this is probably the image we're most familiar of of John. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I thought John was a genius when I started this project, and I thought he was a bit of a weirdo too. John believed in spirits and attended seances wrapped himself up in a wet sheet before going to bed, ate charcoal on a daily basis, treated himself with cold running water when he had tetanus, thought he could ward off cholera by pacing up and down and repeating, I have it not, I have it not, created huge long lists of things he wouldn't eat, including nearly all fruits and vegetables, uh, which he seemed to think were toxic. Uh, and he believed in odic force, which I won't uh, describe to you here, but you can Google it, um, that space was a substance, ether, and that the afterlife consisted of seven spheres of existence that you slowly work through to get to the final stage, Summerland. But I don't see him as a weirdo now, even though much of what he believed we would now call mumbo jumbo. I have learned, I think, the first lesson of biography, that we need to take people on their own terms, not on ours. The 19th century was an age of invention, belief, and exploration. People believed they could find answers to almost anything. John, more so than most. He was at heart an ideas man. He had thousands over the course of his life. Most missed the mark in one form or another, but some didn't. And those ideas helped change the face of a nation. His views on medicine, for example, may strike us as misguided and delusional, but the medical profession had barely entered its infancy by the mid 19th century. To one degree or another, almost all ideas about medicine were wrong. The doctor attending John's brush with cholera, for example, blamed the disease on, quote, the epidemic constitution of the air, another quote, high heat and humidity, and soil poison. Instead, John's life outside of engineering showcased a society struggling to reconcile the rising influence of science with the declining authority of faith and religion. Beliefs were in flux. New knowledge was created at a bewildering pace, much of which refused to sit easily next to established ideas. A surprisingly large number of prominent Americans, judges, journalists, politicians, businessmen, even military officers, took to spiritualism, for example, precisely because of this. In a climate of change and creation, new things seem possible and within reach. New ways to build, communicate, and think. New places, materials, and laws to discover. Even, perhaps, talking to the dead. 
In this, the 19th century was a time of optimism, but also of huge loss. War, disease, and large-scale migration separated family members, often forever, as it did with John, who lost a beloved child in infancy, had a son fight in the Civil War, and never saw any of his immediate family after leaving Europe when he was 24, apart from his brother who he came over with. The confluence of discovery and loss fed the spiritualist movement, which in turn reflects the age in which it appeared. If the religious impulse represents the search for answers in the face of profound grief, then spiritualism offered a comforting, plausible solution to a bewildering era that took away as much as it promised. Spiritualism sought to bring science into the world of faith, to make the afterlife a verified, observable fact. We might scoff at a nation as taken with seances as hard science, but it's entirely possible that during John's life, more people believed in spirits than suspension bridges. John, of course, believed in both. John was a seeker, a believer, and a scientist. He belonged to the blurred line that ran straight through the 19th century, shaping its unsteady but inexorable march. John helps us remember that the achievements of industry and engineering, what we take to be the triumphs of applied reason, are often created by people with a decidedly different perspective on the world than our own. He was also a reminder that people can be many things and that contradiction aren't always as cl contradictions aren't always as clear as with hindsight. Arthur Conan Doyle, the creator of Sherlock Holmes, literature's most rational brain, was a doctor, ophthalmologist, and botanist who studied at one of the UK's most prestigious medical schools. He was also a full-throated advocate of vaccinations, and he believed in fairies. John's achievements in applied science stand in somewhat stark contrast to his ideas about other branches of the natural arts, but his failings in this regard aren't his alone. They belong to the times just as his successes do. One might also say they weren't even failings at all. We think of people like John Roving as embodying great contradictions, but they are only contradictions to us. They weren't contradictions to him or to others of his era. Instead, they were the creaks and groans of a culture working things out, moving itself forward in time and in understanding, trying its messy best to incorporate new aims and new ideas into an existing order. In this, John Roebling was a near perfect reflection of his time. He was a seeker and a believer and an ideas man. He was a 19th century writ large. Thank you. That's the end of my talk. I'm gonna stop sharing. Thank you so much. Um, I, I really have enjoyed both your and uh, Erica's talks. It seems like the Roebling family um, attract some, some great people and great researchers. So I appreciate you joining us and, uh, and for sharing your, you know, your knowledge with us. My pleasure, my, completely my pleasure. All right, I think we have some questions that rolled in and I'm not sure if you will know the answer to some of these, but I will, I will do my uh, duty and ask them to you. Okay. Uh, earlier on in your presentation, you had shown a picture of Roebling and somebody had asked um, if you know if that's a slide rule in his hand in the, in the one photo. Um, let me, let me, is it the, the one at the very beginning? Yeah, it was, it was right in the, the, the start, I believe. I think it's uh, actually a clutch of papers. Okay. Uh, it's not, uh, one side is quite sharp and the other is not so sharp. So uh, mm. that would be my best, my best guess. I was not there uh, when the photograph was taken. Uh, sure. it, looks, it looks, if you look at it close in the photograph, it looks like it's a rolled up series of, uh, of papers. Gotcha. Um, not a question, but someone also uh, wrote in with uh, an obscure fact that the uh, bronze stone. Fact. What's that? I love obscure facts. Me too. Uh, so he said the Bronx Whitestone Bridge in New York was a uh, scaled up version of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge design and was reinforced after the collapse. Did not know that either. Uh, no, I didn't know that either. So that's, that's good. I mean, some of these things like the Wheeling Bridge, the Tacoma Narrows Bridge, it's the same with, I think, the Quebec Bridge, which was a cantilever bridge. When these things happen and there are major structural damages, everyone rushes to all the bridges they've created to see what went wrong, uh, mm -hmm. to learn about, um, learn, if it, see if they can learn or understand something from bridge collapses uh, uh, to make sure that their own bridges stay up. John, for example, uh, added tons of, uh, of uh, cable stays beneath the bridge, inclined stage beneath the bridge on his Niagara Bridge uh, 
uh, when he heard about the Wheeling Bridge. He was terrified that the same thing would happen to his. And so he sort of overcompensated uh, by uh, adding all this sort of extra stiffness or trying to create as much stiffness as he could. Um, the Niagara Peninsula is a really windy place. Uh, and, you know. <laughs> wanted to make sure I got gotcha. you. Um, someone had wrote in, uh, if you know if Ellet, uh, they, they thought that Ellet had built a temporary Niagara bridge before John. He did. Uh, that's, that's an interesting, there's a, there is a lot in my book about this. Uh, and it's actually really fascinating. Um, it's probably the longest section in my bridge. It sort of encompasses two chapters. It, it's the longest section in my book encompasses two chapters. And it's a really interesting and somewhat puzzling episode. It's very dramatic. So the standoffs between Elledge and, and the bridge company, uh, there's all sorts of intrigue about who gets that contract. Um, Ellet and Roebling are sort of both up for the contract to build that bridge. Um, and there's a lot of, if you read uh, a lot of the private letters, uh, it's not really a fair com uh, competition between Ellet and Roebling. Um, Ellet, Ellet really has the inside track on that, even though publicly it's a, it's a fair, uh, fair competition. And Roebling certainly hopes it's going to be, but it, it really doesn't prove that way. Um, and it's, 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 it's really just quite, I don't think I have any real answer as to why Ellet built a temporary sort of wooden bridge rather than get going on a regular bridge. It cost him quite a lot of money to buy that. And he said he needed it to transport goods and materials uh, between the both sides of the, of the, the gorge. But it just wasn't a standard procedure in, 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 in suspension bridge building. So it's a sort of, and it quickly becomes a tourist attraction and they make money on it. So it becomes this sort of, curiosity piece really um but I could, I could talk about that all day i don't think we have all day but it's it's in the book and yeah i like, I like built um the bridge and this sort of basically temporary suspension bridge out of wood and wire uh and john built his bridge sort of around it and he used ellet's bridge uh, after uh, the uh, ellet built his bridge in 1848 uh and then the bridge company ran out of money and John didn't start again until about four years later, but Ellis Bridge was still there. It was kind of falling apart, uh, and John took it down and built his bridge around it, but also used it to get stuff backwards and forwards. Hmm. Very interesting. I like intrigue. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that section is intrigue, and there are fights, and there are guns, and it sounds it's... like the, uh, the bridge building version of uh, Tesla and uh, Edison kind of yeah. uh, standoff with, sort of thing. With firearms. Like <laughs> Um, Kendall had asked if you know how many bridges built by Roebling are still in existence. Um, really only, uh, well, the, the Brooklyn Bridge was built by Washington, which is still around. The Covington and Cincinnati Bridge uh, is still there and is the pride of Cincinnati. It has been substantially redone. Uh, it, was, it was renovated and refurbished by Willem Hildenbrand in the 1890s. And he replaced, he added an extra suspension cable. So he, when it was first opened, it had what, only one suspension cable on each side. Now there is two on each side. He rebuilt a lot of the superstructure and redid the anchorages. Um, and so that bridge is still uh, there, but it's really only, it's really only the towers that are original. Mm -hmm. Most of the rest of it has been rebuilt over the years. Um, the Delaware and Hudson is the only, the, it's uh, the suspension aqueduct um, at Lackawaxen over the Delaware River is still there. But it's still got the same cables, but again, the superstructure has been rebuilt um, a number of times. It actually was rebuilt in the 1980s, and it's actually a beautiful uh, place to visit. If anyone ever's up in the Delaware Valley or around Lackawaxen, go visit. Uh, it's, it's now a roadway for cars, but it's rebuilt to look like a canal aqueduct. So it looks like a canal trunk, um, right. wooden slides at the side. Um, and th those are the only two that are still around. Very few, there's not a lot of 19th century suspension bridges still around. And one of the problems, the problem that, the anchorage problem really plagued John's bridges, but the main problem was just heavy. Things got heavier. And so his Niagara Bridge, uh, when he opened it, uh, trains were about, say, 30, 35 tons. Uh, but by the end of the 19th century, they were like 100 plus tons. And just bridges built in the mid 19th century simply didn't have the capability. John's bridges were super strong and they were built to about three or four times, maybe even more 
the capacity that they that they would ever need. But then suddenly everything else gets stronger, um, it gets heavier, and so the bridges he builds just aren't aren't capable of the sort of modern traffic. They're built for horse and cart, uh, yeah. and the Niagara built bridge was built for for, for trains, but for small trains. Um, and that's what happened to St. Clair Street Bridge. It was a really good bridge and it worked really well for a long time, but then just couldn't take the, the weight. Um, and it was rebuilt. Uh, uh, Whether St. Clair Street Bridge is, I think, I think it's the Roberto Clemente Bridge now, but it's one of the three sisters in Pittsburgh, the self anchoraging, mm -hmm. self anchoring suspension bridges. Um, the Brooklyn Bridge uh, was heavily remodeled by David Steinman um, in, the, uh, 18, in the 1950s. Um, and those big trusses that encased the roadway, uh, the, the lower roadway were added. And it's, there's still height weight restrictions on that. You can't drive trucks or anything over the Brooklyn Bridge. So even a substantial bridge like that, which everyone admires, it really, it's not, it's certainly not, it's just not built. It wasn't built I'm for modern, cars, yeah. <laughs> for lorries, for trucks, those types of things. And, um, you know, it's, it's hard to make, to make engineering works of the 19th century that are based on sort of a, a sort of, amount of strength do the work of the 20th, 20th century. Mm. Uh, so it's a sort of, they all have to be renovated in some way and remodeled in some way. Sure. I think that was uh, most of the questions. I apologize, apologize if I missed anybody's, but um, thank you so much again. Uh, and for anybody out there that's watching that's tuning in just for this talk, we have a ton of other uh, content coming. We're scheduling out until the first week of June. Uh, so please like our Facebook page or head over to our website at nmih.org. Um, also, if you're able to support the museum in any way right now, there's a couple different ways um, that you can do that. Uh, you can find information there, uh, or there's going to be a link in the comments below. And again, thank you to Richard. If you enjoyed his talk, uh, please go out and buy his brand new book. It's, uh, I, I'm excited to read it myself after hearing the talk. So thanks again for joining us. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you to the museum for inviting me. It's been great. No problem. Afternoon, everybody.